Is socialism scientific or religious? This uh, episode is part of my ongoing quest professionally to understand socialism's continuing attraction across generations. Now, one of the questions I, I have consistently is whether socialism is a multiple thing or if there's kind of a core er socialism. So we can look at the kind of history of socialism in the in the modern world, for example, and look at early modern socialism such as Rousseau's or Babouf's, and then as we get on into the 19th century, the uh, and early 20th century, the old left, as we now call it, dominated largely by Marxist approaches. Then a, a breakup of the of the the old left in the 50s and 60s, especially, and the rise of the new left, and then the last generation or two the postmodern left and wokest left, right, and so on. So the question here then is, are they all different? That is to say that there may be as overlapping sets of themes, uh, or is it the case that really these are all just variations on a theme? So a lot of people, for example, will say, you know, this is just neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism or, or classical Marxism. And the idea there is that despite all the surface variations, there's a, there's a core set of Marxist commitments underlying it all. Now, another question, though, is not just the, the content question, uh, you know, whether these are just a, a, a series of overlapping belief systems, all of which we can call socialism because of, say, family resemblances, or if there's just one thing with some superficial variations. But also the, uh, the question of the, the, uh, the attitude, right? Is, uh, is the, the person's commitment based on wishful thinking? Is it based on fact? Is it based on argumentation? Is their attitude uh, uh, what, what Popper called falsifiability? That is to say they're committed to taking their hypotheses and putting them in confrontation with the facts and, uh, and, and, and empirical uh, experiments, right, and, and so on. How did the person arrive at their commitments to socialism? And here uh, we can ask, you know, how much history did they read? How much economics did they study before making a commitment to, to socialism, right? Or uh, was it just a matter of, oh, that sounds like a nice set of ideas, and then they're all in with some sort of faithful commitment? So what I want to do is uh, go back to the original, the ones that most seriously engage this question about whether socialism is scientific or, or, or religious. And I'm especially going to focus on a piece by Friedrich Engels published in uh, 16, or sorry, 1880, just a couple of years before, before Marx died in 1883. So Marx was, uh, was aware of this piece. And this is uh, kind of the mature Marx and the mature Engels reflecting on their place of the, uh, within the history of socialism and their their projections of where socialism needs to go if it's going to be going to be successful so we can of course make a series of contrasts between kind of uh, those who think of themselves as scientific socialists and those who are quite comfortable with saying no we are not scientific we are say religious socialists or we are or a slightly variation utopian Socialism. So there's a long history, of course, of explicitly religious socialisms. And here what we have is a certain ethos and a certain politics or a way of doing social organization that is tied explicitly. And the argument is that it has to be tied explicitly to a certain metaphysical basis, belief in a supernatural dimension and God directing the universe, obeying God's laws and, and so on. So there's the long history of religious communes. So a group of monks or a group of nuns, right, will get together and organize themselves. And, uh, you know, pretty much invariably they organize themselves among small C communistic 
uh, nourishes everybody, eats together and works together and prays together and uh, sleeps together in communal halls. And there's not much individuality. There's no private property and and so on. Uh, we can look at the early Plymouth uh, in in the New World uh, arrivals, uh, the Puritans or the or the Pilgrims, and their first set of. Ex- Experiments. Uh, we're going, you know, we're going to do religion correctly, and they're true believers. And then they go ahead and organize themselves, at least initially, along fairly small C communist lines. And and it's a it's an early experiment in in socialism. Now, before that, in religious texts, we can talk about the Garden of Eden and kind of a Garden of Edenism that runs through much uh, religious thinking in in Western. Western thinking. Of course, there are Eastern religious variations of this. So here you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All has been provided for them. They don't need to work. They can just do whatever it is that, and actually, I don't know what they did all with their days all day, but we certainly know that they don't have to be productive achievers and there's no competition in private property and, and so on. So it's a kind of socialized or communalized paradise that has been provided for them by a wise and and benevolent God. Now, against all of that religious socialism, and it's not to say, of course, that all religious thinkers were socialistic, but that there is a strong tradition of socialism in religious texts as we come into the modern world. But then as we get into the modern world, we have rising naturalism, rising respect for reason and science, and so there's a decline significantly of, uh, of religious thinking. And here what we find, though, is the rise of, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, those who want to accuse certain kinds of socialists that really, you know, even if they think of themselves as naturalists and, uh, and maybe even as atheists, that really they are just secularizing Christianity, right? They've got the same value framework, the same notion that everybody should live in a kind of Garden of Eden uh, with the state providing everything or somehow everything is just provided for. And so what they have is this utopian vision. It's not a metaphysically supernaturalistic vision, but some sort of imagined project projection of how they would like an alternative reality to be uh, yeah, without explicitly going into metaphysical religion. So the claim here is is that they are retaining the same psychology and the same value commitments, but just dropping dropping the the, uh, the metaphysics. So utopianism comes to mean a kind of imagined, uh, fantastical projection of how you want economic and political life to be, and it's a, a kind of secularized religion, but clearly not at all scientific. Of course, uh, it could be that it's not simply that here we have people who have uh, kind of drunk deeply from a certain religious framework and are secularizing it and retaining its value framework. It could, of course, be, in, uh, or be psychologically that the, the direction goes the other way, that first what happens is in people's minds, they have a kind of socialistic wishfulness. They wish that everybody could just you know, live all together communally and share everything, and, and somehow the problems of production are all going to be solved and so on. And that's really what comes first in their thinking. And then they just... Uh, some of them go to a religious, a uh, formal religion with, a, you know, supernaturalistic metaphysical commitments uh, in order to to sue to support. So we still have the question in the modern world: on what is socialism based? Is it, you know, based on some naturalistic uh, assessment of the facts of nature, uh, and that we're putting together, a, you know, a social scientific theory that is falsifiable and 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 so forth, or is it really still primarily a fantasy about some sort of alternative reality? Is it really based on facts, evidence, argumentation, experimentation, the whole apparatus of, of reason, or is it ultimately a kind of faith commitment? In his book, Entrepreneurial Living, 15 stories of innovation, risk, and achievement, and one story of abject failure, Professor Stephen Hicks has put together a series of interviews with entrepreneurs from six different countries and seven U.S. states to explore the adventure and the hard-headedness of business. In this book, Hicks explores what makes for entrepreneurial success and failure. To what extent does success depend on the key decisions, ideas, persistent action or character traits? How does one's business life fit into one's overall life? And how does one even define success? Our belief is that we can always learn from the accomplishments and setbacks of others. The life stories from others can be informative, cautionary and inspirational 
as we each strive to more fully realize our own potentials and achieve our own goals. The 16 entrepreneurs featured in this book are widespread geographically as well as in the range of their endeavors, from sports to education, to fashion, to technology, to finance, to advertising, to architecture, to cosmetics, and more. Observation of success and failure is often the best way to avoid pitfalls, learning from the mistakes of others to get on the pathway to success. This book doesn't disappoint, providing engaging and useful insights from the accounts of 16 entrepreneurs whose reflections are both personal to them and timeless in their significance for the rest of us. Pick up your copy of Entrepreneurial Living, 15 Stories of Innovation, Risk and Achievement, and One Story of Abject Failure by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College Podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Here we are early in the 21st century, and uh, we do have lots of, uh, uh, still in the modern world, examples of clearly anti-scientific commitments to socialism, particularly as we're now in the early 21st century, you know, a, a generation after the collapse of official Marxist socialism in the Soviet Union and dramatic changes in, uh, in, uh, in communist China and so on. And what we find in the last generation or so is that most of the dominant versions of leftisms are strongly influenced by postmodernism with its you know, anti-science stance, its embrace of various kinds of irrationalisms. And certainly many of the social justice warriors, uh, the uh, leftists, they are not at all interested in reason and evidence and so on. They're operating in a certain kind of you know, imagined understanding of how the world ought to be that is not uh, based in, uh, in, in social science projections, and they're not interested in arguing themselves or other people, people into it. So we uh, clearly have now some anti-scientific or at least some non-scientifically uh, utopian kinds of socialisms operating. But if we uh, jump back to you know, the second half of the 20th century, this is, uh, you know, I'm going to cite here Michael Harrington, very famous American socialist, not at all a postmodernist, not at a, you know especially irrational kind of guy, but notice this, and we'll read this description, this is from his uh, long book Socialism, published in 1970, about what, what socialism is, and and the first thing is that uh, you'll notice he's going to describe it not as a science, but rather as a vision. So, quote, there is the vision of socialism itself. Carrying on the quotation, this is not an immediate program constrained by what is politically possible, or even a projection of a middle distance in which structural changes might take place. I'm going to pause the quotation right now. So we're not talking about what's going on now and what's politically feasible, right, and so forth. It's not, right? Socialism is not politically feasible now in his, his estimation. It's not even a projection in the middle distance, a generation or two down the road. You know, we make some major structural changes and then socialism is, is possible. On the basis of either of those, you could still say it's fact-based and, and we're, we're coming up with a rational plan in order to bring it about. But now I'm going to pick up the quotient dictation again. Quote, it is the idea of an utterly new society in which some of the fundamental limitations of human existence have been transcended. All right, I'm going to pause there again to intersperse a few things. Notice we have to uh, start talking in transcendental language. And we're going to say whatever limitations of human existence right now, even the very fundamental limitations of human existence. There are all of the facts that are true of human existence right now. Somehow, all of those have to be go away and or be transcended. Now, getting a little bit more specific, picking up the quotation again. It's, that is to say, socialism's most basic premise is that man's battle with nature has been completely won and that there is therefore more than enough material goods for everyone. Pausing the quotation again, but notice what we then say is, we don't any longer have to fight with nature or battle with nature. Somehow, the economic problems of production have been completely solved, and there's more than enough available for everyone. Then and only then can we start talking about the possibilities of socialism. Picking up the quotation again, 
As a result of this unprecedented change in the environment, a psychic mutation takes place. NVIDIA's competition is no longer programmed into life by the necessity of struggle for scarce resources, and so forth. He goes on to say, so competition completely disappears, uh, we don't have to work anymore, money goes away, and so forth. And that's just my gloss on the last few lines of this quotation. But the point here is that what we have is a fairly clearly utopian vision that somehow in the future, the distant future, all of these things are going to play. They take place. Uh, all of the natural limitations that are placed upon us, all of the economic requirements that are placed upon us, all of the things about human nature, uh, in response to that, uh, that 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 are that are factual realities of our existence right now, all of those are transcended. Then and only then, when that happens, can we start talking about socialism. So we've got some sort of highly utopian, futuristic vision going on. And this is a modern American socialist in the, uh, uh, the latter part of the 20th century. Now, another uh, uh, source I want to mention here, going back to the middle part of the 20th century, uh, Richard Crossman. He was an apostate from, from socialism as a young man. He was uh, committed to, uh, to, to socialism, but he, uh, he lost his faith. Or that's the language that he uses. And he wrote a book in uh, uh, 1949, almost midpoint of the century, titled The God That Failed. And the God That Failed was, in his mind, socialism. And he uh, speaks quite frankly that when he was a young guy, he knew very well, you know, despite sometimes the overlay about logic and rationality and scientific and so forth, that really for him, socialism was a faith commitment. It was a, an appeal of the, the, the sacrifice and the duty and the losing of oneself in this great communal movement. And he speaks in religious terms uh, explicitly about what socialism meant to him. And then he goes on to say, you know, as he grew older, he just could not maintain that faith commitment, that there was uh, in him still some respect for facts and argument and logic and, and the way history was actually going. And so he uh, lost his faith and converted to a, a non-socialist way of, of thinking. Now, I want to jump back uh, to the early part of the 20th century, uh, a quotation from uh, Antonio Gramsci, an Italian communist, you know, initially a true believer in the Marxist system, but then became a kind of neo-Marxist. And he's now widely cited and widely read by those who think that Gramsci is key to understanding uh, cultural Marxism uh, and, and current uh, strategic thinking on, on the far left. But this is from a 1916 uh, publication by Gramsci, where he says uh, quite explicitly that socialism is a kind of religion. So here's the quotation, quote, Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. It is a religion in the sense that it too is a faith, and because it has substituted for the conscience, consciousness of a transcendental God of the Catholics, trust in man and his best, best strength as a sole spiritual reality. Unquote. So the point here is that socialism isn't kind of religion with the same kind of faith kinds of commitments psychologically. It's just that what it is placing its faith in and has a religious commitment to is different from the traditional supernaturalistic one. So we come back to uh, you know, my question about whether uh, socialism is one thing or, or many whether it's scientific or, or not. And we know that all of these different kinds of socialisms are, are possible, postmodern, wokist, uh, Michael Harrington, uh, uh, cultural Marxist, right, and so forth. So all of those ones are socialisms, and they are anti-scientific in varying degrees. So what I want to do, though, now is, uh, before saying, you know, the book is closed, uh, that socialism is anti-scientific or non-scientific, I want to uh, look more closely at the socialism that historically, the major version of socialism that has been most likely to claim to be ruthlessly scientific. And this is uh, Marx and Engels's version. All right, so um, I want to go back to the 1800s then, and I actually want to go back to Marx himself uh, uh, as a young man. This is uh, the late teenager Marx, and I don't know if you uh, have read Marx's poetry uh, written as a young man, but uh, I have. 
And one of the things that strikes me is, uh, you know, in part, this is Marx as a teenager. And of course, lots of teenagers go through a, a writing poetry phase. Uh, and Marx was, of course, of, uh, as a young man, part of the generation in which uh, Sturm und Drang, a kind of a highly romanticized stress and excitement and uh, uh, you know, like a dark adventure uh, sense of what life is all about. So there might be a certain amount of that uh, that's going on in his thinking here. But he also was raised in a religious family, and so he was well aware of the, uh, the religious history. And so what I want, I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from his poetry here, is just to ask you if this has any sort of religious tinge to it. Uh, and tinge, of course, might be too light, that it might be that this is saturated with, with uh, religious sentiment. And that maybe what we can see in, in Marx is someone who initially has a kind of religious psychology and that the socialist commitments are going to be part of a religious psychology, but it's going to be the metaphysical elements that get shed while many other elements of the religious psychology are retained. Now, that's the hypothesis. Uh, let me just read the, the, uh, the excerpts here. This is from an 1836 poem, four lines from a poem called Feeling. Quote, Worlds I would destroy forever, since I can create no world. Since my call they never notice, coursing dumb in magic whirl. Unquote. All right. Now, one way of reading this, and so I'm going to put on my uh, amateur literary criticism hat for a couple of minutes. The third line of this, since my call, they notice never. So here I think of an 18-year-old teenager who feels full of important insights that he wants to share with the world, but nobody's paying attention to him. So I'm the alienated teenager. They never notice my call. My words, when I put them out there, the final line, coursing dumb in magic world. So they just go out into the world and they're just lost. And it's like I'm dumb in the sense of not being able to speak. I'm a silenced being and nobody is paying attention to that. Now we go to the second line. Since I can create no world, right? I, I don't sense that I can be a creative person, bring my vision into reality. And then we have that very nihilistic sounding first line. Therefore, worlds I would destroy forever. So we have, uh, at least in one sense here, the sense of an alienated teenager who feels full of passion and importance, but the world is not listening and end result, or as a result of a reaction to that, I would rather just, in effect, blow the whole thing up. Now, that sounds psychologically parallel to much of what we read in, say, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, with its call for Armageddon and the destruction of the world. Since, and particularly, we have a religious vision. And it seems like the world is still full of corrupt people who are not paying, paying attention to uh, this very important message. And as a result of that, we are projecting a time at which God is going to come back. And those people who didn't listen to us now, they're going to get their due result, which is basically going to be either to be destroyed or to burn in hell forever and, and so on. So do we have in the early Marx a kind of secularizing or perhaps not even too secularized version of that same kind of uh, ancient religious psychology. Now here's uh, from 1837, a year later, from a poem called The Fiddler. And here Marx is uh, getting more, more violent, and he's more explicitly religious, religious uh, or using more explicitly religious language here, speaking of God, speaking of Satan, speaking of having struck a deal with Satan, and so forth. So uh, keep an ear out for those as I read through this time, seven lines from the fiddler. Quote, I plunge, plunge without fail my blood black sword into your soul. I'm actually going to have to pause right there. Notice he's talking about plunging a bloody sword into your soul without fail. All right, picking up 
I plunge, I plunge without fail my black blood sword into your soul. That art god neither wants nor wists, it leaps to the brain from hell's black mists. Till hearts bewitched, till senses reel, with Satan I have struck my deal. All right, unquote, pausing again, uh, literary criticism hat for a few moments. I struck a deal with Satan. And from hell's black mists, right, I come as a kind of uh, a, a avenging demon who's going to plunge a sword into your soul. And obviously that's going to do serious damage, if not kill you outright. So a uh, question then is going to be, uh, in the early marks, do we have someone who has uh, drunk deeply from religiously philosophical ideological wells and has uh, incorporated that into his psychology such that when we read the mature mark with his uh, his understanding of you know class conflict and hatred and the necessity for bloody uh, revolution and dictatorship and so on that we still have some hangovers from this early early marks all right, and if so, then that would be uh, providing some support for the idea that uh, you know, even if uh, Marxism later does become officially atheistic, materialistic, and so on, it's, uh, it's a, you know, at some level of abstraction still a secularized Judeo-Christian cosmology. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claimed that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy-to-understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. All right. Let's now jump a little bit later, uh, a generation later, 1867. By the time we get to the very mature Marx, 1867 is the year of the first the volume of Capital. Das Kapital is, uh, is published. And by then, we've got a Marx who is 30 years older. He's not a teenager anymore. He's in the middle of his career. And he's very clearly thinking of himself as an atheist, as a materialist, as someone who's committed to a certain kind of, of logic, you know, set aside the question questions of dialectical logic in contrast to Aristotelian logic, but he sees himself as an advocate of a kind of ruthlessly scientific socialism. And that's the, the self-descriptive label that both he and his mark, uh, he and his colleague Engel, Engels promote to uh, differentiate their version of socialism from all of the other ones. But uh, it's interesting. So uh, actually, there's an interesting quotation from the, uh, the preface to Das Kapital in 1867, just to emphasize this theme of the strong science status. Right? So Marx, in commenting on how economic developments go, speaks of, quote, the natural laws of capitalist production. And then carrying on the quote, it is a question that of these laws themselves, of these tendencies working with iron necessity towards inevitable results, unquote. So here we have natural law. Uh, and the laws themselves, they work with iron necessity, a kind of determinism here with inevitable results. And on the basis of that, then we can go on and make predictions just as scientists and social scientists do. So what we find then is a, a very clear 
anti-religious set of rhetoric here, and that at this point we have an explicit philosophy that's worked out that has been dismissive of faithful commitments, uh, you know, wishful fantasy sometime in the future, know it's definitely going to happen, and the idea, of course, that religion itself is uh, as an ideological system, not only but false, but in the service of bad people, the capitalists who are just using it to advance their own interests uh, against the proletariat. The religion is officially an enemy at this point. Now, this is interesting. So that's the 1860s. But I wanted to just jump again back uh, 20, 20 years exactly to 1847. I'm choosing 1847 partly because it's the year before the Communist Manifesto is is published, uh, which is published in 1848, and that's uh, Marx and Engels' most famous work, of course. But there's this fascinating letter that was written by uh, Friedrich Engels to Karl Marx toward the end of 1847. And the, uh, the manuscript uh, has been written, and uh, we know it's going to be published from uh, 2020 hindsight is going to be published as the Communist Manifesto. But it's interesting uh, what the working title of, of, the, uh, of, of the manuscript is. And so here from the letter from Engels to Mark, he's suggesting a title change. And he says, quote, give a little thought to the confession of faith. I'm going to pause right there. By the confession of faith, that's the working title for the, uh, the manuscript. It says, give a little thought to the confession of faith. I think we would do best to abandon the catechetical form and call the thing Communist Manifesto. So this is Engels then in 1847 suggesting the name that they're eventually going to adopt, but notice that he's saying we should reject the notion that it's a confession that we are making, that our manifesto is a set of articles of faith, right, or that we're engaging in uh, creating some sort of catechism. And so all of that religious -y language is still very strong in the rhetoric uh, as late as 1847, and it's only going to then be in uh, either late 1847 or at some point in 1847. It's going to be dropped rhetorically, and then we get the, uh, the, uh, the clear rhetorical turn at the very, very least. And then 20 years later, by the time we get to Das Kapital, it's very strongly uh, anti-religious, both in content and in rhetorical form. Uh, and dismissive of all other versions of socialism as being either explicitly religious or at least utopian, and, and we can't go that way. So now I want to uh, walk through a few of the important themes from uh, Engels' Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. This is a manuscript that was published in 1880, so three years before Karl Marx died. So Marx is aware of it, and uh, it's, it's Engels' uh, writing, and sometimes Engels is actually a, a clearer writer to, uh, to my mind. And so this is a monograph. It's published you know, 32 years after Communist Manifesto. It's published 13 years after Das Kapital. And what uh, Engels is concerned to do in this context is to say that it really is Marx's version or Marx the, the Marx-Engels version that is the one that is most purely scientific and uh, even then still in the middle part of the 1800s all of the utopian versions of, of socialism need to be set aside. So Engels does credit some earlier socialists, Saint-Simon, Fourier, and Richard Owen, the Englishman, for identifying some socialistic principles. He recognizes that, in fact, they are believers. And especially uh, what makes them socialist is that they are anti-capitalist uh, for moral reasons. It's not particularly that they are good as scientists, but he believes that morally their hearts are in the right place and that anybody who's going to be a socialist has to be anti-capitalist for moral reason. But he does think at the same time their socialisms are just kind of idiosyncratic thought constructions, and they, these guys don't really have any realistic uh, implementation plans, and so they're still in the utopian category. Now, another important point that's interesting is uh, that uh, uh, Engels argues that part of the problem is not just that the utopians haven't necessarily shed religious psychology uh, entirely. He does recognize that a lot of them are operating in an enlightenment world, that they do think of themselves as being enlightenment figures, uh, you know, with uh, the enlightenment's emphasis upon science, reason, right, justice, equality, and so forth, all of those uh, central enlightenment vision principles. But then what Engels goes on to say is that if you are going to be a 
socialist of the best sense, you have to realize that the Enlightenment is limited, if not wrong. So he wants to argue that the Enlightenment itself is, quote, the idealized kingdom of the bourgeoisie, unquote. And so the Enlightenment philosophy, despite its being relatively scientific, is not the right kind of science. Uh, and so really it is a projection of some limited class interests. So the capitalists or the bourgeoisie or the, the property owners, they have their interests and that the scientific uh, worldview expressed in the Enlightenment that they have been very active in, in promulgating, that itself is not the right kind of science. So the right kind of science has to be an anti or at least non-Enlightenment kind of science. And so Engels goes on to say, quote, to make a science of socialism, it had to be first placed upon a real basis. And by a real basis, then Engels argues, uh, we have to go with you know, the, the main themes of Marxism, that first and foremost, we have to be materialistic. Right? Everything is material and in a fairly reductionistic fashion, that of all of the materialistic forces that are operating in reality, economic material forces are the most important ones, that when we are talking about logic and the development of those economic materialistic forces, we do have to be logical, but it has to be not old-fashioned Aristotelian logical. It has to be a dialectical logic that embraces contradictions uh, realistically. So that's going to be an important thing. And that kind of logic is very much non-enlightenment. And also it has to be deterministic. It has to be environmentally deterministic. And so the enlightenment with its belief, at least in some of the enlightenment figures, in human autonomy, human agencies that underscores their understanding of the moral dignity of human beings, all of that so-called scientific basis uh, or understanding of human nature, that has to re be rejected for a, a kind of, of, uh, of determinism. And of course, that then is going to mean that if uh, different individuals are in different economic material circumstances, their thinking is not going to be autonomous, but rather it's going to be determined by their different positions in the economic system. They're going to have different beliefs, different values, different ways of looking at the world, those viewpoints, people are not going to be able to think outside of them. So we're not going to be able to have you know, discussions and debates to resolve our differences rationally and logically and so forth. Instead, what we are going to have is clashing competitive worldviews driven by clashing economic interests. And uh, the only way that those are going to be resolvable is by means of a forceful, uh, and in some cases outright revolutionary, and in some cases violently revolutionary processes. So carrying on, right, Engels goes on to say, you know, uh, the reason why economics is fundamental is because human beings are material beings and they need to, uh, they need to eat. Uh, quote, the economic structure of society always furnishes the real basis on and yet, by the time we get to the capitalist form of social organizations, capitalism is about competition between property owners, and so we end up with warring classes of society. The classes are trying to exploit each other, and all of them are experiencing various kinds of alienation. But out of all of this conflicting uh, uh, alienation and, and competition, there's going to be a certain kind of dialectical uh, resolution, and history is going to move on to the, the next stage. And this is uh, kind of Marxism 101, society is going to move from a tribal stage early on to a feudal stage to our current capitalist stage. Then it's going to move into an explicitly statist stage, marked by a dictatorship of the proletariat, and then ultimately it will get to a socialistic stage. Now, why uh, we are making predictions here uh, and, and, and doing a kind of social science is uh, that uh, Marx does think that we can argue that there are certain axiomatically 
necessary things that we can project based on an understanding of how capitalist competition works. And so the two big things that have started to happen, particularly in the 1700s and the early 1800s, is that the uh, the first large-scale capitalists in the 1700s started to organize workers into larger and larger economics. Instead of most of the workers being spread out in the countryside, the early capitalists started to big, big factories and around those big factories then came to be developed urban centers. So we are organizing what are initially scattered workers into cadres. Right? They all are living in more or less the same place, the same neighborhoods. They're spending all of their working days working together. They are being organized by the capitalists and the capitalists are imposing upon them rules about when they're supposed to show up, what they're supposed to do. They're imposing a discipline and a kind of structure. So we have increasingly larger scale organization occurring in, in society. Now, of course, uh, that is a great organizational achievement, and Marx recognizes it and Engels recognizes it as a step forward, but it has a kind of immorality built into it from their perspective because the, uh, the capitalists, they think, uh, expropriate more of the, uh, the, the, the resulting profits for themselves than they uh, deserve to get in that particular circumstance. Nonetheless, the capitalists are a progressive force for history on this, this one score. The other big thing that is happening is the Industrial Revolution. And so what the new machines are doing, of, are of course, uh, uh, taking over a large amount of production and producing more, producing higher quality goods, uh, and, and so forth. And so that is a progressive step forward. But in addition to the capitalists expropriating the surplus value from the Marxist per perspective, and so therefore doing an injustice to, to the workers, what the machines are also doing, aside from organizing the workers, is putting increasingly them out of work. So the machines come along and do more and more of the work, which means fewer and fewer workers are needed to do the work. So the point is going to be that the workers, as a result of capitalist development from both of these forces, are going to be marginalized alienated from their livelihoods, alienated from the wealth that society is, is, is producing, and then ultimately alienated from work itself. They're going to be made entirely superfluous in, uh, in the capitalist economy. So the way uh, Engels puts it is, uh, quote, thus it comes about, to quote Marx, that machinery has become the most powerful weapon in the war of capital against the working class. All right, so bad news for the workers under capitalism. Now, an interesting point, though, is that Engels goes on to argue, and this is sometimes overlooked right, in, uh, in many criticisms or, or, or readings even of, of Marxism, particularly popular readings, is that Marx and Engels go on to argue that the exact same developments within capitalists also make the capitalists superfluous. And this is a direct quotation from Engels, quote, these, uh, sorry, quote, it's a compulsory law unquote, that these large-scale economic developments by, uh, and technologies then make the capitalists uh, superfluous because you know, basically all they need to do eventually is you know, sit around in their offices, pull a few levers, fill out a few ledger books, right, and so on. But eventually all of those things are just purely administrative functions that can be formed by clerks. Uh, we don't need the capitalists to do that anymore. And then as the machines get more and more efficient, the, the development of new machines becomes less and less important, and maybe even the machines can start making the further machines and, and so on. So even the capitalists become superfluous. Quote, the merchant and the manufacturer are socially quite unnecessary, unquote. And so then Engels goes on to argue that eventually their economic functions can and will be taken over by the state. And so what will then is have a large state administrative uh, set of functions. Everything is basically going to be run by the government. It's at that point, the proletariat, who are, of course, miserable, they are, they are alienated from pretty much just everything, but they have developed a kind of class consciousness. They are organized. They are angry. They're going to realize that they have the superiority of numbers. What they are going to do is then rise up and take over by force. Quote, the proletariat seizes political power and turns the means of production into state property, unquote. But then 
Engels goes on to argue that there's a continuing development here. So we now have a dictatorship of the proletariat. Everything is owned and run by the state. But, quote, in doing this, it abolishes itself as proletariat, abolishes all class distinction and class antagonisms, abolishes also the state as state, unquote. So here's the line about the state eventually will wither away. So production will be uh, fully organized, fully automated. This is the next point I wanted to mention here. It's all done by the machines. Everybody knows what they need to do rather to be military. The administrative structures are all in place. And so Engels goes on to argue it's at this point we have freed humans from, quote, the mere animal conditions of existence, unquote, and thus freed, quote, man himself more and more consciously can make his own history, unquote. So notice where we have ended up is this idea that once the capitalists have organized everything, and once all of the machines are developed to a high level of development, we don't need capitalists anymore. We don't need machine makers anymore. We don't even need many organizers uh, because it's all pretty much automated at this point. And then the system or the machine, so to speak, runs itself pretty much without needing for any human intervention. As a result of that, all of the stuff that we need is more or less made for us, and we can then just do whatever it is that we want to do. And from the Marx and Engels perspective, it's then and only then do we stop being animals, animals that are slaves to nature, slaves to machines, slaves to the man, slaves to capitalists. We are then freed, then and only freed, and we can start making our own selves instead of being made by all of these forces beyond our control. In Stephen Hicks' newest book, Liberalism Pro and Con, Dr. Hicks examines 15 arguments for liberalism and 15 against in detail and expands upon the significance of each. To get your copy of Liberalism Pro and Con, click on the link in the description of this podcast or hop onto the web and search for your copy of Liberalism Pro and Con. While you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast and follow us online on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Parler and Minds. Now back to the podcast. My question at this point then is, since the question is scientific socialism or utopian socialism, scientific socialism or religious socialism, how logical is this system? How realistic is this system? And I want to focus especially on uh, you know what Engels and Marx are saying are the last two steps of the development. And I think it's one thing to be able to say, you know, we live in a natural world, people have to eat, we are material beings, there is competition. And on the basis of that, you can have a certain kind of theory. I don't think it's a true theory about economic uh, exploitation and alienation and that uh, certain kinds of things are going to happen in the future. Okay, now I can understand that that is scientific and there is a kind of logic to it, even though I don't think it's true. Right? So that would then just be one hypothesis about economic development that we would have arguments and so forth. But notice uh, the last two steps of this seem to be of a different order. The first one is a claim about politics, that having seized power, we will get to this dictatorship of the proletariat state, but the state is necessarily going to wither away. The question then is how realistic an understanding of human nature is that. And so what we have to imagine is, given what we know about human beings, if we can imagine them having complete dictatorial power over an economy, how likely is it that they will relinquish that power and voluntarily, whatever that means, right, and so forth? Or is this uh, some sort of uh, waving a magic wand and saying, I hope or wish that the state power would just wither away, particularly given the long range of history of what happens, not always, but most of the time, when any individuals or any group of individuals do acquire a significant amount of power. Now, notice, of course, that the Marxists have said, well, when this happens, there is going to be this psychological transformation of human nature, that our psychology 
is just a reflection of or a product of our environmental circumstances. So maybe you and I, given that we are raised in the kind of culture that we are in right now, we can't project what this alternative kind of human nature would be like, and so we can't really imagine it. But if you're going to make that kind of argument, then uh, that's starting to sound like a non-scientific or non-realistic claim. You're saying that you are imagining some sort of transformation that you cannot describe into another kind of being that has never existed before in human history. So that's question number one. How politically realistic is that, that final stage? Now, second, a kind of an engineering and economic projection that is made in these final stages here, that human beings will transcend all of their production needs. And so what was then going to happen is machines are going to do to develop to the point where everything that we need and want in order to feel and to develop ourselves fully as human beings, the machines will make it for us. We will not be bound by the necessity of economic production. How realistic is that? Now, of course, there's an interesting claim because now here we are in the uh, the early part of the 21st century. Artificial intelligence is making a strong, uh, strong, uh, strong progress. Robotics is making strong progress as well. And right now we're having quite a few people who are saying, well, you know, this is basically meaning that in 10, 15, 20 years, basically all of the robots are going to be doing all of our jobs and there's going to be nothing left for us to do and we're not going to have to work, right? And or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the software is going to be developed sophisticated enough that all of the, the thinking work is going to be done by software programs and, and next generation computers so human beings don't have to think. So we don't have to do physical labor. The robots are going to do all of that. We don't have to do any thinking labor. The software is going to do all of that. And then what are human beings going to do? And some people are thinking that that is a realistic assessment of the human economic technological right assessment. Okay. Now then the question is going to be if we then jump back to the 1870s, 1880s or so that's 140 almost 150 years ago, how realistic in the latter part of the 1800s was it a drive to say that all human needs will be met and people won't have to work at that point. And then at the same time that this is projected as a positive state, of course, in our generation, a lot of people are worried, you know, what is the meaning of life going to be if I don't have a meaningful career available to me? Well, we do kind of find, or not kind of find, but strongly find in Marx and Engels is this idea that that's a desirable state not to have to work. And so to notice the claim that we are right now just animals. And why are we just animals? Well, we're just animals because we're at, at a we're, we're, we're not even a, a human beings yet in a full sense because we have to work. We have these material needs that we have to side. We're, 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 we're constrained by economic circumstances and so forth. And only once we have transcended all of that animalistic stuff, then we can only become human beings. But then what we're doing is defining our desired state as human beings against what are realistic material and economic circumstances. A human being then is defined not as part of the natural world as it really is now, but as somehow having, again, transcended all of those. And so the question I've got is, uh, have we not just gotten to some sort of modern Garden of Eden scenario? And by modern, I mean that it's not a God-based Garden of Eden scenario. So if we go to the earliest Garden of Eden, the idea there is everything was just provided by God, and then God puts human beings in the, in the garden, but then he leaves them alone. And then they can do whatever it was that Adam and Eve did all day, but they don't have to work. And that's the ideal circumstance initially to be put in. But now what we've got is Marx and Engels saying that everything is basically going to be provided by the state. And all of our material needs are going to be looked for. And then the state is going to wither away. Or the state is going to go away to leave you all alone. And that doesn't strike me as psychologically very much of a difference. And it doesn't strike me as very much of a value difference. And in both cases, what we have is the projection of some, I don't even know how far in the future state where 
some rather unlikely things are supposed to happen and then we're supposed to imagine that there's a a, a huge transformation of human psychology into another kind of being which again we can't quite imagine so i end with the same kind of questions about the claims of utopianism versus science so even in the mature marx and the mature angles they are very vociferous in claim we are not utopian we are not religious but there still seems to be a question about whether they are getting to their ultimate vision for where they want their version of socialism to be. Are they getting there first by wishful thinking and then just developing a philosophy to support that? Or is it really the case that they're first looking at economics, they're first looking at history, and then they're projecting logically results that they think can be argued for and so forth? Now, I think that both psychologies are, of course, uh, possible. My sense about Marx and Engels is that, that it's a mix. Initially, socialism is a kind of faith for them, and, and it does then come to form a deep part of their psychology, but they are enough individuals of the modern world to attempt to do a certain amount of, of science. They do have a certain level of respect for naturalism, for logic of whatever sort, for, for, for an understanding, uh, trying uh, to put uh, human psychology on a more naturalistic setting as well. But I do think that what we have is then a kind of tunnel vision developing within a certain kind of combination framework that is from the outset a little bit of science and a little bit of, uh, of utopian faith. Now, the relevance uh, uh, for our discussions now in the 21st century is that I do think all of these versions of socialism are still out there. Some are metaphysically tied to supernatural dimensions. Some are naturalistic. Some of them are based on a certain understanding of history, a certain understanding of, uh, of, of, of economics. Some of them do seem to be just wishful projections. Some of them are based on, uh, on, 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 uh, on the willingness to argue and discuss. Some of them seem to be very angry and adversarial, and they just want to smash anybody with whom they have a certain amount of disagreement. So I think what is best and most important in contemporary understandings of socialism and in any sort of attempt to interact and have arguments or discussions with socialists is that you have to get to know your interlocutors individually, to get to know what's going on in them psychologically, what's going on in them epistemologically, at least rhetorically, and at least in terms of the variations of, of, of socialism right now, there is no one-size-fits-all argument strategy that's available to you. Instead, we do have at least family resemblance socialisms out there. There's quite a lot of them. Some of them are more prominent than others. But uh, what you need to do and what I need to do is uh, get to, in each case, know who is my intended audience and then to craft the particular argumentative strategy for that particular audience. You've been listening to Open College with Dr. Stephen Hicks. Follow us on social media and visit opencollegepodcast.com for all Open College episodes and feed links. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave us a review or click subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey. For more on Dr. Hicks's work, please visit www.stephenhicks.org. For all our other podcasts, please visit our website at www.postcollegepodcast.com. Absolutely correct.com.